But I have to say that my favorite cocktail is actually pretty simple. Um, I really love a good gin and tonic. Uh, and I wow. think the reason that I like that is uh, it was kind of the first cocktail I ever really had. And it was at a friend's beach house on the south shore of Long Island. No, I actually also like gin and tonic. There was a time in my life where I was, I think, a little bit addicted to it. I think the way, and this gets at what I think we have to do over the next decade, um, we have to change our mindset about how we think about what makes for effective cybersecurity. How do you see public-private partnerships, PPPs, evolving in the realm of cybersecurity? I mean, I, I mean, we both serve on at the at the World Economic Forum Cybersecurity Council, right? We also understand why, you know, also that cybersecurity information, especially in the private sector, is very confidential. What it's really getting at, right, is one of the struggles that we have is that we don't actually have good language for what we want this relationship between the government and the private sector to be. Welcome to the very first episode of Cocktail and Blurbs, the show where the ice never melts, the spirits are always high, and the conversations are as rich and well-layered as a well-crafted Manhattan. I'm your host, Lindy Wimatlady, and today we are blending the world of cybersecurity with a dash of insight. We are speaking to a man who's been on the forefront of our cyber defense. Michael Daniel is the president and CEO of the Cyber Threat Alliance, and he's also a former special advisor to President Obama. To start off, Michael, could you share your favorite cocktail with us and perhaps a story why it's your favorite? Well, I'd have to say that my favorite cocktail is actually pretty simple. Um, I really love a good gin and tonic. Uh, and I wow. think the reason that I like that is uh, it was kind of the first cocktail I ever really had, and it was at a friend's beach house on the south shore of Long Island. And so it just... Mm -hmm always reminds me of like summer on the beach and, you know, kind of relaxed times and things like that. So that's why I like a good gin and tonic. Well, no, I actually also like gin and tonic. There was a time in my life where I was, I think, a little bit addicted to it, but I've moved on. <laughs> I've got help. So <laughs> from policy to protection, you've transitioned from coordinating the U.S. government cybersecurity strategy to leading an alliance uh, dedicated to sharing threat intelligence. How does your approach differ from pri uh, public to private? Many of the approaches actually remain the same. Um, a lot of what works in terms of coordinating across different government agencies also applies to working with many different private sector companies. Um, being collaborative, being open, uh, uh, being listening um, to what people actually say, um, mm -hmm. trying to adapt and understand uh, other people's perspective, where they're coming from. All of those work in both the public and the private sector. I think some of the biggest differences, right, is that the rhythms are different. Um, in the public sector, you know, the motivations, the drivers are a little bit different um, than yeah. in the private sector. No, it's actually interesting. I always find that thinking, you know, sometimes when you work in the in the in the public sector, sometimes also the speed, right? Like, you know, things are relatively slower, you know, and people, yeah, yes. yeah. So during your tenure um, as the cybersecurity coordinator, can you take us through an a critical incident response that was a turning point for U.S. government, well, or rather, U.S. cyber policy? I mean, I think in many ways, I mean, there were several, right? And mm -hmm. I always say that um, I had multiple holidays ruined by, you know, different actors at different points <laughs> in my time. But yeah. the probably one of the biggest incidents that, you know, sort of changed at least how the federal civilian agencies thought about cybersecurity was the intrusion into our Office of Personnel Management. Mm -hmm. And uh, that goes by the acronym OPM. And OPM uh, does exactly what the name sounds like. It basically manages personnel policy across the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the time, it also helped conduct a lot of the background investigations. So looking into people's past to grant them a security clearance to make sure that they could have a security clearance for the U.S. Yeah. government. 
And for a long time, they'd stored those records in paper. Mm. Um, but in the, you know, sort of mid 2000s into the 20 teens, you know, they were actually digitizing those records. Mm. And what nobody really thought about was that those then became vulnerable uh, to a cyber intrusion. And well, so that's exactly what happened in the spring of 2015. We discovered that there had been an intrusion into the Office of Personnel Management. Now, interestingly, the way that they discovered that intrusion was because they were actually improving their cybersecurity. Um, oh, wow. They <laughs> turned on some additional capability uh -huh. and discovered that there were there was beaconing. There was, you know... Um, communication going on to a location that wasn't legitimate mm. and when we started looking into it we realized that some intruders had gotten into the, the the network they had taught themselves how to program in COBOL because the databases ran in COBOL because they were so old and they had extracted a lot of information from from OPM about these background investigations now, you can imagine that for espionage purposes or for data theft purposes, these could be mm -hmm. really valuable, right? They include yeah. a lot of really highly personal details. The reason this was a turning point, I think, was not so much the actual intrusion itself, because oh. um, that was not overly sophisticated, but it was the response. Mm. It was the how do you actually coordinate and... Um, communicate with mil literally millions of Americans mm. um, that their background investigate that their background material had been you know stolen and was potentially out there. How do you communicate with Congress? What are the implications for other civilian agencies? And in fact, the biggest effect of this incident was that civilian agencies who mm. had previously never considered themselves to be a target in cyberspace, now perceive themselves, they realize they could be a target. Wow. I think also what's interesting for me is when you're talking, like, I mean, 2015, to think that, you know, the U.S. government would still be, you know, having a database running on co on COBOL is something interesting for me as somebody coming from Africa, because we assume that, you know, because a lot of technological advancement, I mean, the, the U.S. is a leader in it. So the assumption is you're always on the forefront of everything. Now, I want to talk to you about... Um, you know, the ecosystem, right? Um, with your experience in both government and nonprofit sectors, how do you see public-private partnerships, PPPs, evolving in the realm of cybersecurity? I mean, I, I mean, we both serve on at the at the World Economic Forum Cybersecurity Council, right? We also understand why, you know, also that cybersecurity information, especially in the private sector, is very confidential. It's like, you know, Google is not just going to come out immediately and say, guys, yay, we got hacked. They're not going to tell you that. So it's really interesting for me just to see, you know, what do you think? What it's really getting at, right, is one of the struggles that we have is that we don't actually have good language for mm -hmm. what we want this relationship between the government and the private sector to be. Yeah. Right. right. Because in most of the time, the government is an enforcer right, has law yes. enforcement or, you know, um, it's a regulator, right, or it's a consumer, right, it's buying goods and services. Yeah. But in this case, it's not doing any of those things. It's mm -hmm. actually trying to build this two-way relationship with the private sector, with the nonprofit sector, like the organizations that we run, to accomplish a mission, mm -hmm. right, which is to raise the level of cybersecurity across the digital ecosystem. And that's a so that's why we have trouble with this term public private partnership because we don't yeah. fully know what it means. Yes. And I think we've still got to you know we've got a lot of work to do to um to shape it out. But in my view it's really about actually enabling both sides to do better at what they do. Right? Yeah. It's about enabling the private sector to be more effective at protecting customers and clients. It's about enabling the government to be better about protecting the society as a whole, right? Yes. And so when you drive towards that, what you really want is you want to figure out how you actually share not just information, but yeah. also plans and intentions. 
And then how do you actually coordinate actions against the adversaries so that you impose the maximum costs on them? And also, I mean, the issue of privacy, right? Like, you know, the companies that I share my, my information with, I'm hoping they're keeping it, you know, safe and they, they're not sharing it. Right. And I also hope that the information that my government is holding, you know, um, on me, they're not just sharing it with a private company. So it's, uh, it, those are, it's really interesting and I'm hoping that so, somehow we should be able to find a way that, you know, works for everybody. But um, now let's talk about the big, the big, big issue, which is budget. Looking back at um, your time with the Office of, um, of Management and Budget, right? What challenges did you face in securing the money that you need, um, you know, to, to, or even to advocate to get the funding that you need? Given that, I mean, like, you know, when you explained earlier, you know, people sometimes they think like, I'm not a threat, you know, I'm, I'm, why would everybody go after Lindyway? I'm just, uh, I'm just Lindyway, right? But we know that it doesn't work like that. So how, how did you manage that? I think a lot of, well, you're absolutely right. And particularly when we first started really funding a lot of cybersecurity activities in the U.S. government in the mid 2000s, it mm-hmm. was very challenging. And I would say that one of the biggest challenges was that the people that were asking for the money were very technical. Mm. And so they would roll in with the, and they they would come in with their requests and they they were very technical and they were very detailed and nobody could understand them. Right. You know, (laughs) the, right. It was the, what, you know, the snort flabulator 6,000 and we need to get to do the what (laughs) and the who and the, what on earth are you talking about? You know? And so, so what we really had to do was we actually had to spend the time on our side, on the budget side, to get enough understanding of the technical parts to to know what it was doing. But then we had to think about how to translate that into into concepts and analogies that really smart, but not technical people could understand. Mm. And so that's been really kind of one of uh, the things that I've worked very hard at over the last 15, 20 years, frankly, actually over my whole career in um, in government and now in the private sector is how do you take really complex concepts and issues mm. and render them into bits that, re- again, really smart, but not necessarily experts can understand. No, that's interesting. And also, you know, sometimes, you know, technical people, you feel like if somebody doesn't understand, you feel like you need to talk slow. And when it's not really about the speed, it's really about right. what are you saying? You know? Right. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So um, now let's take it to the, the global cybersecurity landscape, right? How do international dynamics um, play into Cyber Threat Alliance. I'm more interested in, you know, from your work strategy, especially with diverse threat landscape and 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 varying national uh, policies. So does your work only focus just in the U.S. as a, as a Cyber Threat Alliance, or uh, if you were working with with multinational companies, does it also, you know? get to a point where you will be like, hey, you know, President Ramaphosa, you know, somebody has your iPad, you know, <laughs> there's a there's a joke on that where he, you know, lost his iPad. So it's funny. <laughs> he misplaced <Right>. his iPad. <laughs> yes, yes. I, I think I remember seeing some stories about that. Yeah. yeah. The, uh, um, you know, actually, so CTA is a global alliance. Um, we have uh, 35 members from around the world. Um, mm-hmm. About half are based here in the U.S., but about half are based outside the U.S. And um, you know, we—I mean, it, 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 you know, Linda, it's—it's it's even down to things like we have to have. Sometimes we actually have to have multiple meetings. Mm-hmm. Of the, you know, we have to have multiple of the same meeting because we're trying to actually hit all of the different time zones. Yes. Right? Because you <laughs> yeah. know, there's never a time when the whole planet's awake. So exactly. sometimes we actually have to double up on meetings and. And I, I raise that simply because like that's something that people don't think about, but like you you have to do those kinds of time management things if you want to incorporate people from around the world, right? Yeah. You have to have meetings at times that are not necessarily totally convenient for you because you know you need to accommodate somebody else's time zone. Mm-hmm. Um, 
So a lot of what we do, you know, really, when you talk about geopolitics for CTA, um, I mean, I would say, you know, sort of two broad things that I'd bring up. One is we very much want that global perspective. Yeah. Because what, you know, what are what our members that are based in Japan or Latin America, what they see is what they detect is different than what mm -hmm. an American based company detects, even if it has, you know, operations in other parts of the world. Those companies come with a different cultural lens. They come with a different um, set of capabilities. They focus mm -hmm. on different things. And so we very much want that perspective um, in CTA. And also, I mean, it goes back to the importance of having diversity in tech, right? Because yeah. when you have different, you know, people from different backgrounds, they also see what you would not see, you know, from, from, Absolutely. from, from a cultural perspective. So, yeah. And also, I mean, when you mentioned with regards to the, to the different time zones, that also means it's also possible to have your cocktail any time of the day, you know, <laughs> because it's midnight or it's 10 p.m. for, for somewhere, somewhere in the world. Anyway, right. <laughs> um, now um, let's talk about um, the digital uh, defense and offense. How has the offense defense uh, balance in cyber operation shifted over the years? Um, and where do you see it heading in the next decade? I think the way, and this gets at what I think we have to do over the next decade, um, we have to change our mindset about how we think about what makes for effective cybersecurity. Mm. Cyber, effective cybersecurity is not keeping the bad guys out. Effective yeah. cybersecurity is preventing the adversary from achieving their goals. Mm. So if we stop them from getting in, that's great. But if they can get in, but they can't move anywhere in your network because it's properly segmented, yeah. guess what? You win. Yeah. If they can get in and they can move around some, but they can't really get to any of the data or anything that's interesting or lock up anything, you still win. Yes. Okay, maybe they can get to the data, but it's encrypted. So when they try to get it out, they can't really do anything with it. You mm. still win, yeah. right? Like the We have to change the way that we think about cybersecurity to be much more about like, what are all the ways that we can stop the bad guy from getting whatever it is that they want? Let's talk about the next generation, which is something I'm really, really passionate about. Um, with cyber landscape constantly evolving, um, what advice do you have for up and coming cybersecurity professionals, especially women and people of color? I mean, we know how we have very few um, of those in the sector. And how to, because I think also something, I mean, a lot of the work that I do with Africa Teen Geeks is to bring the next generation um, into tech, uh, specifically Africans. Um, you know, how do you, like, what is your vision in terms of what you, you think we could do, but also to make sure that in 10 or 20 years, my daughter and your son don't sit and have the same discussion again? You know, I think... For me, it's really also about connecting cybersecurity to different passions, mm. right? If you are passionate about, you know, different subjects, you know, how do you actually bring that in? I, in fact, I actually had, I was doing a career day um, at my uh, younger son's school. Mm -hmm. And I had this young woman, she asked me, she said, well, I don't think there's probably much room for an artist in cybersecurity. And I looked at her and I said, oh, no. I said, have you looked at the imagery we have in cybersecurity? <laughs> it's all like shields and like white dudes and hoodies, like at keyboards. Like yeah. we need like different imagery. We need artists who can mm -hmm. help us convey. You were, we were talking about how do you communicate cybersecurity, right? We need yes. artists who can help us, visual artists who can help us visualize and mm -hmm. talk about cybersecurity in different ways. Mm -hmm. And so... For me, it's really about broadening what cybersecurity is to say that, you know, your background, your interests are actually important to this discipline. A look ahead. Um, as we mix our drinks, see, I want to, with your coffee, <laughs> um, I want, let's also mix in some predictions. What emerging cyber threats should we be most mindful of? Um, and how is this, um, the CTA preparing for them? Things like cybercrime um, are going to continue spreading to other, like they already affect the whole world, right? Mm. But 
I think that as other countries digitize more, as other countries move into this digital environment even more, right? Mm. The potential for disruption, the potential for adverse effects from the bad guys are going to grow. Um, and they're mm. going to grow in parts of the world that probably haven't seen themselves as the targets, just like we yeah. were talking about earlier. And so I think some of this is about you know, how do we help how do we help in that cultural context, in that political context? How do we help other parts of the world learn lessons from our experience so mm -hmm. that you can do a better job, they can do a better job, you know, embedding cybersecurity from the ground up? No, my last question for you um, is really around collaboration. I know, um, you know, you love collaboration. I mean, we, we, you can't have you know, achieve what you want to achieve without that. If you could create a cocktail then that represents the essence of Cyber Threat Alliance, what would it be called and what would be in it? <laughs> I mean, I think in some ways I would, I would just, you know, I would call it the blend. Um, okay. And it would have, you know, it would have, and I haven't worked up a great recipe for this precisely, but in my head, it's like got, it's got like a special, like the special drink of like lots of different cultures and mm -hmm. lots of different countries sort of mixed together in a way that actually works, like okay. that tastes good, right? <laughs> a punch of some sort. <laughs> but that it actually represents a blend of a whole lot of different flavors that mm -hmm. would not be sort of on their own wouldn't necessarily like really grab your attention, but that mixed together, they actually really, um, you know, are eye opening. That's the best way I can um, describe it because that to me, the the power of CTA, again, it comes back to that, that blending of different perspectives and different cultures. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I should note, you know, like that's hard. It's hard work. Like yeah. it takes people out of their comfort zone um, it's, it's not been necessarily easy for, I think a lot of people to engage in that, but it's what we have to do. And yeah. so I, I've, I, I've decided that there are times when I just have to make myself uncomfortable yeah. because if I'm not, then I'm not pushing the boundaries enough. No, that's great. I mean, that's, that, that's exciting. And I can't thank you enough for making the time for me. And you are an inspiration. And one thing I've actually wanted to tell you, which I think I didn't tell you, is when I met you, um, you know, initially when we were at GFC and I saw your profile, I expected somebody who was going to be like up there. And then I met you, you were so humbled, like such a, a nice, genuinely kind person. So thank you for that. And thank you for being so approachable and, um, I hope we have more Michael Daniels, you know, that would be able to <laughs> support, you know, up and coming women like myself and a lot of other uh, other people. So thank you so much for your time. Um, I can't wait for us to share a cocktail together, your gin and tonic, um, because coffee and my cocktail just doesn't go that well. <laughs> I agree. So I will look very much look forward to that. And thank you very much. And thank you for having me. Whether you are a cyber guru, or someone who just figured out that your password is not password. Raise your glass and let's toast to a man who helps keep our digital world safe. One encryption at a time. Cheers, Michael.